in verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 12. For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched with fire and burnt up with fire, nor blackness and darkness. Now what mountain was that? What mountain was touched by fire? For the children of Israel and the Old Testament. Sinai, right? Mount Sinai. So he said, now, now he's talking to the Pentecostal Hebrew church. Okay? Now he's saying, for you were not come unto this mountain that might be touched and that burnt with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the words which voice they heard you know they heard the voice of God in the mountain that came to Moses and said we don't want to hear this anymore you hear God for us you know they were afraid of that they for they could not endure that which was commanded okay and, uh, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain it shall be stoned and thrust through with a dart and so terrible was the sight that Moses said I exceedingly fear and quake and that was Mount Sinai okay he said, but you've got to leave Mount Sinai. How many of you know we've got to leave Pentecost and go on? See, Mount Sinai speaks of Pentecost, and we'll come back to that. But you are coming to Mount Zion. That's Paul was saying, that's where we need to go. Now, under the city of the living God, under the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn which are, which are written in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant doesn't that sound like an open heaven? it does to me he said the church this is where the church has to come to okay and it, then he gives this whole list you know of what an open heaven is like now, they came 50 days from Passover, right? They had the Passover, which speaks of us, salvation. They came 50 days to Mount Sinai. 50 speaks of what? Pentecost. They came 50 days to Mount Sinai. And then, but Paul says, now, we don't want you to camp here. There's much, much more. There's a promised land out there. And eventually when you get into that promised land, David is going to bring the ark up onto Mount Zion with no veil. The veil will be rent. The ark will be in full view. And you'll have an open heaven. He said, that's where you've got to go to. And so, you know, Jesus died on the cross when they were celebrating Passover, literally celebrating Passover in Jerusalem. Fifty days later, what happened? The Holy Spirit came. Pentecost. You know? But you know, the church has habitually stopped at various levels of truth. And this is the problem. Okay? Calvin came on the scene with the Reformation. Brought a lot of truth, you know? How many of you know? You know, the Lutheran, Luther came on and brought truth. But Lutherans are still around today and haven't moved on. Baptists came on the scene. The Anabaptists and the Baptists came on the scene. Brought truth. Wonderful. But they're still there. Pentecostals came on the scene. Brought great truth. And we are still there. No different to the others. Criticize all the others. We are no different. We've camped here saying we've reached it. We've got the gifts of the Spirit. We've got healing. We've got the book of Acts. And Paul is looking down from heaven. And he's saying, for goodness sake, read Hebrews 12. <laughs> Let us go on. See, don't camp here. There's another place I want the church to come to. You are come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Where's the city of the living God? Up there. He said, we've come to that. We should start experiencing that now. 
where heaven and earth begin to come together. He said, okay, city of the living God, sounds good. Unto an innumerable company of angels. Now, how can you come to an innumerable company of angels if you don't see them? This is talking about reality, you know. He's not talking like a, a, another language. We've come to an innumerable company of angels. How do you know that? When it's happening. Because somebody tells you, or do you see them? Right? Right? The general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which is written in heaven. Now let's just let's just kill another sacred cow, shall we? <laughs> the general assembly of the church of the firstborn which is in heaven is not Christians who have died and go to heaven. That comes later in this list. These are a special group of people who have been translated through the ages. And they have a special mission to the church in this last day. This is a church. They're the first to reach this. Getting quiet here. We'll come to people in heaven in a minute. To the general assembly of the church, the firstborn in heaven, is not just the average person who dies and goes to heaven. These are a special group of people. We're going to visit the earth. If we will build it, they will come. Mount Zion. Hallelujah. And the judge of all. And the spirits of just men made perfect. Now that's the people who died and went to heaven. Okay? Not this other group. They've been in heaven, but they're in a different part of heaven. Now, the people, normal people who die and go to heaven, the spirits of just men made perfect. The two different groups here, you see. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaks of better things than a Abel. Now, when I was in Bible school, they taught me that this verse was when we get to heaven. When we die and we go to heaven, this is where we come to. You know, the city, church of the living God, city of God, angels and all that. When you die, this is heaven. The Bible is not here talking about heaven. Paul is saying, you've camped at Pentecost, but there's much, much more to go on to. You know, usually when we don't understand something, particularly theologians, but if we don't understand things, we either spiritualize it, or we put it into the heaven or the millennium. And miss out on a host of truth that God wants for us now. Zion, Mount Zion, speaks of an open heaven. See, David put the ark on Mount Zion. And it was an incredible period because we're still under the old covenant. You know, in the temple there was a veil. And if you went in there, behind that veil, you would die. The high priest got in once a year on the Day of Atonement. But you couldn't get in there. The average person couldn't get in there. The veil. Now, it's still in the old covenant... David took the ark from the Philistines, they brought it back, and he didn't put it back into a temple, into the tabernacle. He put it on Mount Zion with the tent, with an open, no covering, no veil at all. And he said, you know, wh what is this? You know, it cuts across everything in the Old Testament. You know, there was a brief, a brief prophetic interlude where God wanted to show the church where he's going to bring us to. That's what the tabernacle of David was about. Just a brief prophetic interlude. And, and where he wants to bring us to. It was strange. Time, period. 
He said, out of Zion, God has shined. It was like a lighthouse up there. They could see the glory of God coming out. I mean, it was a very unusual time. It's time. Amos 9, 11. Build the tabernacle of David again. Come to an innumerable company of angels, church of the firstborn, spirit of just men made perfect. We come to that realm. God wants to take us into that. God the judge. The church is going to come to a place where we will see through the eyes of the Lord. You know, I had an experience and I was preaching in a convention. And in the middle of preaching, I saw the Lord standing at the back of the aisle. It was about twice the size of this auditorium, twice as long. And I saw the Lord standing at the back. And I was watching this while I was preaching. And uh, it was putting me off a bit because I thought. And then he started real purposeful to walk down the aisle, looking at me. And I thought, God is good, God is good, God is good. <laughs> He walked right up to me, and he walked straight into me. Turned around, and started to look out through my eyes. And then, every movement I made was no longer me. I became animated, but it wasn't me, it was him. Everything I did was him. And I looked at some of the people I knew, and... Um, I knew these people, so a lot of these people. But when I looked, when I was looking, or he was looking through my eyes, I saw them totally different to the way I had seen them, or I understood them. There was a man sitting on the front, and he was having problems, and I counseled him quite a bit, and I was kind of a bit fed up, you know, because we weren't getting anywhere. And it, wasn't cooperating too well. And I looked at this man and I looked straight back into his history and the mitigating circumstances in this man's life. Why he was like he was. What caused this problem? What was it in his upbringing? What happened to that man? And by the time it was finished, I wanted to get hold of that man and just love him. I was beginning to look at him with the Father's eyes. And how God loved that man, how God understood why he was the way he was. And it was like a total, you know, totally animated. My, the way I judged people was totally renovated, totally the way I looked at people. And it was, this went on for quite a long time, you know. And you know, when we come to the place where we're crucifying the flesh and starting to walk in the Spirit, you see, it's not so much of who we are in Christ. It's who Christ is in us. You know that whole teaching who we are in Christ? We've got to be careful with that. It's who He is in us. And when that experience was over, the Lord stepped out of me and He said, that's where I want to take my people. I want to live in them that way. And I thought, so do I. I want that more than anything else. It was an incredible experience. It was no longer I that lived, but Christ who lived within me. And that set a goal in my life. I thought, I need to go after that. You know, in... You know, ministry gifts are different to gifts of the Spirit. How many of you know that? The gifts of the Spirit, charisma, are just gifts of the Spirit. And it's a gift that you are given. Ministry gifts are not like that. The, the word gift, when it talks about, and he gave apostles, prophets, those, the gift is the word doma. The man, the person is the gift. But it's Christ in them, in that whatever office it is, evangelist, pastor, prophet, teacher, apostle, that man is the gift to the church, but it really is the office, that particular office of Jesus in that man, and together they are the gift to the church. And it, it's like, 
We need to understand this more fully and how this whole thing works because he wants to walk in us as well as with us. Moving, you see, from Pentecost to Tabernacles come, speaks of a place where there is an open heaven. Hallelujah. Interesting verse in John chapter 1, 51, it says, And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you'll see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. See, Jesus walked under an open heaven. Wherever he went, that open heaven went with him. You know? He walked, it just the portal, the open heaven went with him. Angels of God ascending and descending. Not only that, he could look straight into heaven. And it's, it's like... goes on to say in John chapter 3 and verse 13 and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the son of man which is in heaven now you work out one out he was he's here he is on the earth but it says he was in heaven Jesus was on the earth as well as being in heaven See, he walked in those realms there was an interaction there was there was no barrier between the two realms he walked under that open heaven. You see, in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 19, it says, And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, took five loaves, two fishes, and looked up into heaven. And he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples to the multitude. See, there was an open heaven. And he did only things he saw the Father doing. He could look straight into heaven. He could look straight into the throne room. There was an open heaven. You say, oh, but that was Jesus. He was the first of many who would come after him, who would be like him, and walk as he did. Mark chapter 7, 34. And looking up into heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Be open." See, but he looked up in the heaven. He could look straight into heaven because he had an open heaven constantly over his life. See, this happened, remember Stephen, when he was dying, being stoned, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Father. You know, and, and he saw that when he was being stoned. But, you know, it's not God's purpose that this will only happen to us when we're on the point of dying. It does happen. But it's meant to be walked in. And you say, well, these were, you know, famous people in the Bible and they, you know, had special mantles and special... They were ordinary people just like you and me. These were ordinary people. And you say, well, it's not for me. Well, then it is not for you. Simple as that. You just say, I can do that. I can do that. Why can't I do that? You can do that. 